Cultures throughout history have struggled with intolerances, which social tensions, prejudices, and hatred of various kinds. This is nothing new. We go to the very beginning of human society, and guess what we find? There was those kinds of intolerances and prejudices. And here's how it lays out. Here's how we find this. We would understand from the creation that every human being that was alive at the time of this incident would be from the family of Adam and Eve. In other words, they would all be kinfolk. You'll remember that what happens that Cain develops a hatred towards his brother. And he rises up and he kills Abel. God gives him a punishment. What does Cain address God with once God lays that punishment on him? He says, you have banished me from the land and from your presence. You have made me a homeless wanderer. Anyone who finds me will kill me. Why? Why is Cain worried about that? They're all family. And Cain is terrified because he understands that that society, that's going to be unacceptable. They're not going to tolerate that. There's going to be a prejudice against him because he killed his brother. And he's terrified. And so God says, well, I'll give you this little mark. Anybody that messes with you, I'll mess with them seven times harder. Nothing new. Nothing new. This isn't American. It's human. And, and, and I just had to stop myself because I started, I started trying to, to come up with examples that I could remember and to look for other things. Every society has struggled with elements of intolerance. And that's why the whole subject of loving our way out of hatred is so vital for us. Social hatreds are usually nurtured by things like this, thinking or the lack thereof, ignorance. In other words, people, people get messed up because of what they think or what they choose not to think. Stereotyping people, unrealistic expectations play a role, fears and biases are elements that contribute to the idea of, of having this uh, prejudice towards others. Blame and shame, com competition for power, greed is always an element, and, and uh, correlationalism, just lumping everybody together. Those are all things that happen within society when we get all wrapped up in things that are on that annoyance hatred continuum that we've been talking about. These are the kinds of things that get us all riled up. One of the premier works that's been done on the study of prejudice and behaviors was done in the 1950s by a Harvard professor, Gordon Alport, and he wrote The Nature of Prejudice. In that book, one of the areas that he researched was the escalating nature of prejudice or hatred. In other words, how, how, how it got worse and worse. And here is, here is the gist of that diagram. It all begins with disparaging speech. Now remember what it was we've looked at in Romans chapter 12? Remember what the first step was in learning to love through our hatred? Watch your mouth. So it all begins with disparaging speech. Then it moves into what he called avoidance. Avoidance. By way of example... The Nazis encouraged Germans not to associate with Jews and their storefronts, whatever they were. You don't shop from a Jew. And that was, that was avoid them. The next was discrimination, exclusion from activities like employment, etc. And then subtle aggression, where there's an oppression, there's a, a, an assumption, a group assumption, you speak for. You don't listen to, you speak for someone. And again, that's how this all escalates. And then it enters into the area of physical attacks on, on property and on persons. And the last thing is extermination. And by way of fairly modern example of, of extermination, Siber uh, Serbia calls it ethnic cleansing. Nazi Germany called it the final solution. You just get rid of it, get rid of those folks. 
So there, there is what he came up with, what he devised. In that same work, he also discussed six conditions which would help overcome those things. One was mutual interdependence. This became, this became the primary element of thought during the 60s in overcoming prejudice in our country was to integrate, to gain connection with people that we tended to have prejudiced feelings toward. So mutual interdependence, sharing in a common goal, equal status, informal interpersonal contact, multiple connection, and promotion of equality. So I wanted to share that with you just to, just to get everybody aware that that is truth. However, the ultimate truth, the ultimate truth, the ultimate source in knowing how I can work my way beyond hatred is God and his plan. There is none better. There is none that will work as his does. So one more time, we return to the text that we have been examining. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Be in agreement with one another. Do not be proud. Instead, associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own estimation. Do not repay evil for evil. Try to do what is honorable in everyone's sight. If possible on your part, live at peace with everyone. Friends, do not avenge yourselves. Instead, leave room for his wrath, for it is written, Vengeance belongs to me. I will repay, says the Lord. But if your enemy is hungry, feed him. And if he's thirsty, give him something to drink. For in so doing, you will be heaping fiery coals on his head. Do not be conquered by evil, but conquer evil with good. When we began this study, we looked at an overview of the book of Romans. And Romans outlines how humans have sinned. It outlines the salvation process. It moves into the sanctification, how we continue to grow. It, it gets into, in chapter 9 through 11, it talks about the sovereignty of God. But then when we get to chapter 12, the main thrust of those chapters from 12 to 16 has to do with Christian service. And it's not just doing things, it's service that glorifies God. God. And that's what those chapters are all about. The section of the text that we're looking at are about ways that God's children engage in certain activities which bring him glory. So we take that truth and just highlight what we've looked at. We serve the purpose of glorifying God when we decide to manage our mouth. When we have been cursed, we're going to bless in return. We talked in that lesson about the dangers of sharing with others negativity about people who have hurt us, offenders. And God says the place where you begin is you learn to shut up. You learn to keep your mouth quiet. And so... As we think about how am I going to work my way out of hatred, the, the beginning place is I don't spread the hurt that I feel around. That's what God says. Difficult, but it's what God says. We moved on from that and, and looked at the phrase, we are to rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Mentioned that in context, that's not just talking about, you know, everyday, con it's talking about the turmoil, the negativity in relationships. That's the context. So when I'm, when I'm offended, I need to attempt to understand the emotional state of the one who's offended me. I need to try to weep with them. I need to try to understand that there may be something in, emotionally at work that lies beneath this offense. And again, that calls for me putting some of my feelings aside to attempt to understand their feelings. But it isn't only the emotional makeup. An offender has gone through a thought process. You know, whatever it is, and, and obviously if I've taken offense at it, it's not my thought process. They, they, have, they have reasoned a certain fashion to reach the conclusion that has led them to commit this offense to me. 
If I'm going to work my way out of hatred into love, I'm going to have to attempt to understand how they got there. Now, that's specifically what Paul is talking about when he says we need to be in agreement with one another. He's not talking that we see things identically. He's talking about we're willing to look at each other's beliefs, reasoning. So I'm not so proud, not so arrogant that I dismiss that and say, you know, their reasoning just doesn't make a lick of sense. No, I, I am to process, how did they get there? What got them to that place? We then talked about the fact that God very specifically says that we're not in position to deal out vengeance. That, that, is, that is one of his uh, responsibilities. Nothing wrong with vengeance. God's going to do it. There's nothing wrong with God. There's something drastically wrong when I do it. I do not have the information. I do not know the, the, every motivation. I do not comprehend things well enough to be in charge of dealing out vengeance. And so God says, you leave it alone. It's not yours. I will take care of that. In verse 14, it says, don't repay anyone evil. Try to do what is honorable in everyone's eyes. We looked at the fact that the idea of honorable there is you do something astonishing. So we, we try to find some way that we can engage in some activity that's going, that's going to just be so honorable that people will wonder, why? Boy, that's just, that's just fantastic. And we looked at some real life examples of people that had done some of those things, but we return something beautiful to our offender. And we lose, we, we totally lose the mindset of winning and losing. We're not just wanting to win a battle. We just don't, don't, don't need to win our way. We need to win the peace. And that needs to be what we pursue. And we talked about the fact that there are a couple of caveats to that. If possible means that sometimes it may not be possible. And on your part means I bear responsibility to pursue peace on my part, but that's all I bear the responsibility for. So we pursue peace, and in doing so, we glorify God. And then we found out that, that we, do not, uh, we do not need to take the place of God. The idea of leaving room for God to work in negative relationships uh, sometimes is very new to us. Backing off, praying, just letting God get in and do what God can do in those situations, we need to, uh, to leave God his place. The last time we looked at verse 20 and found out that um, we're supposed to bomb our enemy with love. And the, the whole concept there of, of burning coals is not that we are retaliatory. You know, we're not processing, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this because it's going to make them miserable. The motivation for us doing this is that, that we're honoring God, we're glorifying God. The, the result of us doing that is it's going to be like coals on that person's head. And we talked about how that produces shame and that shame is going to, re, going to do one of two things. It's either going to harden somebody or it's going to make them soft. So uh, we, we, we begin to just bomb them with love. Now, as we wrap this all up, these are not just optional accessories to add to your spiritual walk if you're so inclined. These aren't just, you know, this isn't a matter of opinion. And you can have this opinion or not have this opinion. They are directives for the sacrificial life believers have agreed to render. This is all firmly established within the context. You know, context is so important. Look where this, this chapter 12 begins. Therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, I urge you to present your bodies as what? A living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God, which is your spiritual work. This is all about you sacrificing yourself. And then he moves on. Do not be conformed to this age. Don't reason the way people do, the way your flesh wants to, but be transformed. How? By the renewing of your mind. By the renewing of your mind, so that you may discern what is good and pleasing and the perfect will of God. So Paul begins by pointing out that the individual responsibility that one makes by committing their life to serving God. Then he identifies that we do not live that sacrificial life individually. We're part of a body, and that's where the text moves. 
it goes from you present yourself as a living sacrifice, but guess what? You're part of a body. And here's where we pick that up. For by the grace given to me, I tell everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he should think. Instead, think sensibly as God has distributed a measure of faith to each one. Now, as you have many parts in one body, and all the parts do not have the same function, in the same way, we who are many are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. According to the grace given to us, we have different gifts. If prophecy, use it in accord to the standard of faith. If service, in service. If teaching, in teaching. If exhorting, in exhortation. Giving with generosity. Leading with diligence. Showing mercy with cheerfulness. Love must be without hypocrisy. Detest evil, cling to what is good, show family affection to one another with brotherly love, outdo one another in showing honor, do not lack diligence, be fervent in spirit, serve the Lord, rejoice in hope, be patient in affliction, be persistent in prayer, share with the saints in their needs, and pursue hospitality. And that just makes you want to say, amen, that's the body I want to be a part of. But then where does God go? Oh, it's not always going to be that way. Because just like every society, the sacred society of the Savior, the kingdom of God, the church, is not without negative and unconstructive relationships, attitudes, and behaviors. That beautiful description of the body is what we're, what we're striving to be, but guess what? It's not the total reality of what we are. And so then he moves into what we've been studying. Why? Because every one of us individually have laid ourselves on the altar, sacrificing ourselves to God, committed to transforming our lives by the renewing of our mind. We are a part of a body that is diverse and different, and we're going to offend each other. We're going to hurt each other. That's what happens in every society. The question isn't if. The question is what are we going to do about it? How are we going to respond to that? So Paul finishes this chapter with this list of directives on how to conquer those evil events with good. When we began, I, I, I listed several reasons that we were going to study this. One was because the, the, the current social surrender to the harms of hatred. And at the time when we started this, there were riots going up and on in downtown Lincoln. Society is feeding its hatred. As God's people, we need to be different and that's what the text is all about. And that's why I, I thought we need to study this. We also said I, we need to study this because historically the church is often not very healthy in dealing with negative relationships and offenses. We get all bent out of shape. We start a congregation down the street. And that's not God's plan. That's not how God says you deal with it. That's how the world says. That's what the world's doing. And look how it's working. Guess how it works in here? The same way. It doesn't. It doesn't work. And everyone in this room who has any history with our fellowship has witnessed, has witnessed God's people not acting at all like God, not obeying the things that we've talked about, people serving their hatred rather than harnessing it and loving their way out of it. I also mentioned that this is an eternal matter for every individual. I mean, this, this has eternal implications. You see, the reality is that some brethren may refuse to seek to work through negativity in God's fashion. Every social group has some of those kind of constituents. So the objective of our study is not just an unrealistic goal that we're going to eradicate all negativity and that uh, we're all just going to respond just perfectly the way you know, Christianity is a goal, it's a process, it's never an achievement. The objective is that while such has and will always exist, always going to be there, it must become the exception and not the rule. In other words, it, it needs not to be the norm. While it's possible to remove all such behavior, it must not be allowed to become the routine. So the question of today is simply this. Which is your life? Is it the exception for you to deal with an offense negatively? Or is it the norm? Is it the rule? The collective kingdom of God 
will take on the very nature of the individuals who make it up. So do not expect a church to be what you're not willing to be. If you desire a church which deals with negativity in accord to God's plan, you must deal with your negativity in accord to God's plan. If we sit in here and we say, you know, it's, it's the rule for me to respond in negativity, but I don't want to be a part of a church that responds to negativity in inappropriate ways, you don't have that privilege. We are all responsible for the nature of our kingdom. We've been doing the digging deeper worksheets to accompany this study, and I, I have no idea how those have helped or if they have helped. But I, I mentioned when we started that th this is truly a serious study. The implications are so vital. And if you've engaged in the introspection, then the next step, I think, is going to be making a commitment that addresses uh, any future negativity, offenses that come to me. In other words, if, if I've been looking at these things and processing, what am I going to do from this point on? How am I going to change? How am I going to renew my mind? How am I going to transform myself differently? So I have a, a sheet that I, I try to make it the size that will fit in most Bibles so you can, you can tuck it in your Bible. It's a place for you to put your name if you're, if you're willing to commit that you're going to make negative response to an offender an exception for you. Not the rule. And then I've also listed all of the, <clears throat> the eight different things that we've examined from this text that are the process of loving our way out of hatred. So this is like, this is like a, a cheat sheet. <laughs> and when, when, when all of a sudden you've been offended and you're struggling with how you're going to respond, you're gonna, you can have this tucked away in your Bible and it'll be like, Oh, I, I'm, not, I'm supposed to be doing different now, so what can I do? And you can, you can glance down through that and say, ah, I want to make some changes there. I want to do some things differently. The fourth reason, I guess, that we also began this study, and, and I want to attempt to share that with you. During the, all this COVID stuff, when, uh, when we were offering the worship uh, resource at home, and so I was working on those things. And, you know, it, it was a powerful time for me personally to, to just introspect. Uh, there were things happening, and I was watching and remembering and processing things of, of my past. That when, when, when Becky and I moved to Butte, Montana, that congregation was known in the state for its arguing and fighting. That's what it was known for. So much so that my father-in-law, before we moved there, he came over and preached a sermon. He pointed his finger at that congregation and he said, you had better not hurt my son-in-law. And I remembered that I often preached on how important this is. And Butte was a strange place. There'd be brethren in the back entryway cussing at each other on Sunday morning, so angry they couldn't control their words. And Sunday night they'd be on the front pew. I'll take a whole congregation of people like that rather than people who deal with offenses negatively. And I got to thinking about the body in Sydney, Montana. We moved there and they just had fired their preacher. And they tried to install elders a few years before, and it was a great big fight there. And we moved into a place where people didn't know how to love each other very well. And we heard the message often. The only place I've ever moved that was not known for fighting was Lincoln, Nebraska. But I've learned something. It doesn't matter if you're known for fighting or not known for it. You do. We get offended and we handle it incorrectly. And I process, I probably haven't preached on this nearly as much as I have other places. And so that weighed very heavy on my And I thought, we're going to hit it. 
And then we're going to hit it again. And we're going to hit it some more. And I'm not going to let us forget this, folks. This is what makes the body of Jesus, Jesus' body. Twelve ends. And this was our first lesson. This is not just a possibility. If we do it God's way, it's guaranteed victory. No exception. If we don't do it his way, there are no guarantees. Do not be conquered by evil, but conquer evil with good. Let's pray. Our Lord God in heaven, we thank you for this day that you've made. We thank you for our lives. We thank you for the strength you gave us. It's not because of how righteous we are, but because of the love you have for us. Lord, we know you have a purpose for our lives. And as you've called us into your body, we ask that you continue to teach us your ways and continue to encourage us. Help us to be loving just as you are love and to make love our culture, to care about one another and to shine the light wherever we go through love. Father, we know we have seen in many ways we've done things or said things that are wrong. We ask for your forgiveness and we ask that you continue to send your Holy Spirit to be with us, to guide us. As we go home today, we pray that you continue to be with us throughout this week in everything we do. We pray for this nation, especially in this week of the election. We pray that you will take control of this country that no matter the outcome, we will continue to have peace. We pray you bless all those who are feeling sick. Some are in a hospital, some are at homes. Many have different challenges in their lives. You are the master of every situation, and so we call upon you to be with us and to be with everyone whatever they are facing at this moment. We also pray for the community health, for the public health, at this time when COVID situations are rising. We pray that you protect us, because no matter how hard we try by ourselves, it is hard to completely eliminate it. So, Father, listen to us and continue to draw us closer to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.